for what is the seventh session of our webinar series about the impact of COVID-19 on the real estate sector. I'd like to acknowledge our partners, speakers, and panelists. Our event partner, AmCham Philippines, represented by Eb Henchcliffe, uh, and Ernie Cecilia, both my good friends as well. Thank you, Eb. Thank you, Ernie. The Contact Center Association of the Philippines, CCAP, represented by its president, Jojo Ulagan. Uh, and also from, from uh, beaming in from India, Satish Rajendran of Knight Frank in India. Satish also sits on the global board of Cornet Global, the premier uh, global corporate services uh, organization. We also have Christian Chum Carino and also Corey Luz of Harrison Assessments. Uh, welcome Chum and welcome Corey. We also have Dennis Nolasco of Santos Knight Frank, uh, Morgan McGilvery of Santos Knight Frank, uh, also Abby, Abigail De Silva, Francis Gagno, and Jesse Sevilla of Santos Knight Frank, and Paulo Ab Abellanosa as well, who've made this webinar possible. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone for, for, the, for making the time, and I'm grateful um, that you have been able to join us this morning. In terms of a little bit of background about our, about our company, uh, by way of an introduction, uh, Santos Knight Frank is the leading full-service real estate advisory company in the Philippines. Uh, we founded the company back in 1994, and we provide the full range of real estate services, including a full suite of occupier services, including uh, where we market leader in commercial agency, office services, leasing transactions. We've done more than 40 million square feet. We've represented most of the Fortune 500 and Fortune 50 multinationals. Project management, where we're market leader. Uh, facilities management, where we're one of the largest international facility and property managers here in, in the Philippines, where we manage over 17 million square feet of facilities. And we've got teams on the front lines supporting the hospitals, 24-7 BPOs, gas stations to reach retail spaces, et cetera. We also have a large technical services engineering footprint. Uh, Knight Frank's global reach spans 60 countries, more than 500 offices worldwide covering the United States, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia Pacific. Over the last five months, the world clearly has gone through an unprecedented transformation, especially in the ways we work. Uh, our webinars have gar garnered more than 30,000 attendees, and everyone is asking the same questions. How can we return to work safely and productively? Today, we will focus on workplace reoccupancy from two dimensions. First, we, we look at the experiences of India and the Philippines. These markets have much in common and are the leading destinations for outsourcing companies in the entire world. Knight Frank has an extremely strong presence in both markets and are leaders in the occupier services from transactions to facilities management, engineering, project management, et cetera. Secondly, we look at the individual employee experience. Our friends at Harrison Assessments will be, talk, will be talking remotely, remote working, and how data can be used to guide strategic management decisions. And Santos Knight Frank has also used these assessments are, are, as well, and they're excellent. To get us started, I'm pleased to welcome one of the most respected names in the human resources professions in the Philippines, Ernie Cecilia, co-chair of AmCham's Human Capital Committee. Ernie's a good friend of mine, and he has 45 years of experience and training in human resources management and consultancy, and he's held posts in companies such as Unilab, Caltex Philippines, San Miguel, etc. He was formerly the president and executive director of the People Management Association of the Philippines, and today co-chairs the Technical Working Committee on Labor Policy and Social, social Issues, uh, and how those are influential to, to employers, including the Employers Confederation of the Philippines. Ernie has seen the rough and the smooth here. Nobody has more experience with regards to labor in the country, and the current situation is unprecedented. So having said that, Ernie, over to you, my friend. Thank you very much, my friend. Uh, welcome in behalf of the Board of Directors and Committee Chairpersons of the American Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines. We welcome you to this very important international event, and let me acknowledge the presence of Rick Santos, Chairman and CEO of Santos Knight Frank. Jojo Oligan, President of the Contact Center Association of the Philippines, Satish Dora Rajendran, Chief Operating Officer and Head of Facilities, and Asset Management Services of Knight Frank India, Christian Carino, Deputy Director of Harrison Profiles, Dennis Nolasco, Executive Director of Santos Knight Frank, 
and of course, our very own uh, Paolo Avellanos. Avellanos has made this uh, webinar possible. Thank you to our partners, Santos Knight Frank, for collaborating with AmCham on this international webinar on workplace reoccupancy. I'd also like to acknowledge the Contact Center Association of the Philippines and its members, as well as our attendees from India who have joined us this morning. The COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent economic downturn are truly unprecedented events in our history. And there's a great deal of uncertainty across the world as we all want for the completion of the development of the appropriate vaccines. The recent imposition of modified enhanced community quarantine or MECQ in Manila has emphasized the daily risks that we face in gradually reopening the economy. It is imperative that organizations strike the right balance between business continuity on one hand and safety of the people on the other hand. But how do you do this when there are no prior experiences or viable case studies to benchmark our plans? Like uh, most of the participants, I'm very eager to hear from our speakers from India and the Philippines and share our experiences from different industries and markets about best practices in workplace reoccupancy, business continuity, and keeping our employees and customers safe as we navigate the new normal together. Again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and have a productive day today and more years of COVID-free life, work, and leisure. Thank you. Ernie, uh, thank you very much, and thank you for that kind message. Uh, to provide an overview of the workplace reoccupancy in the Philippines, I'm very pleased to introduce Dennis Nolasco, the Executive Director of Facilities Management at Santos Knight Frank. Dennis has over 22 years of professional experience in the fields of facilities management, covering operations, maintenance, design, systems engineering, project management, energy management, building services, etc. In his role, he makes sure that our team implements ISO 9001-2015 quality management standards and deliver only the best in class client experience to our customers nationwide. Dennis has been working extremely hard 24 seven throughout the break and on the front line. Dennis, over to you. Yeah, Rick, uh, thank you for that introduction and also Ernie, uh, for the purpose of this particular meeting. So, uh, good day for everyone. Uh, I'm excited to actually share what is uh, what had happened over uh, from the start of the lockdown until today. So, uh, I will be starting off with a little uh, recap of what had happened uh, since the start of the lockdown, when what was that, and uh, where we're currently uh, into now. So, the uh, uh, the first ever case that had been reported over the country was back in January 30, or in a, uh, the, the, a 38 year old foreign national uh, came in. And uh, afterwards, uh, around March 7, that was the, the first report of the local transmission here in the country. And uh, uh, <clears throat> later on, March, on the March 16th, uh, the government decided to, uh, to start a lockdown all throughout the major cities and provinces in the country. As, as, as you can see uh, on the slide, uh, on March of, uh, 16, uh, er almost every location here in the Philippines are packed on uh, extreme community quarantine, the strictest classification of the lockdown. And uh, uh, later on, uh, it... it uh, when it had been uh, in two months, it had been uh, on the same condition, extreme community quarantine, uh, while on May 16th was the introduction of the government for three more classification, uh, which is the MECQ areas, the GCQ areas, or, and the uh, modified GCQ areas. So if you can see uh, on May 16th, uh, it's Metro Manila, Bulacan, parts of Pampanga, and on the south, it's uh, Cebu, wherein the, the, the height of the infections are actually uh, tallied. So uh, that remained to be on ECQ at that particular uh, day. 
and the most of the areas are uh, was um, declared by the government as to undergo uh, modified uh, extreme community quarantine. And in June one is uh, that um, most of uh, the cities had been relaxed in terms of uh, implementation. So most majority of the locations, even Metro Manila, where in most of the uh, major CBD areas are located, we had been declared uh, to undergo GCQ or the general community quarantine, which is the third classification, the more relaxed one. Uh, uh, it was implemented by the government to actually reopen the economy and uh, uh, so that we will be able to recover. And uh, on August 4, is, uh, you can see that uh, we had been declared back again to uh, MECQ, uh, namely for Metro Manila, uh, Rizal, Laguna, and Cavite. Uh, so, and uh, actually on Cebu. So we continue, uh, so these are the, 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 the timelines that have happened over the nation and uh, what had been the declaration of the government all throughout that timeline. So going to the next slide. So the operational sectors uh, or what we call the essential establishment that had operated all throughout the lockdown. So manufacturing is one, uh, basically supporting our food and beverage, uh, the manufacturing of our, our, of our hygiene, our PPEs, our uh, ventilators, so they, they continue to operate, medical products and other essential items uh, have been uh, uh, BAU for most of the manufacturing that are producing these products. Uh, for the outsourcing, which is the contact centers, the IT outsourcing uh, establishment here in the Philippines, uh, they some had operated as BAU, but some had uh, decided to operate on a certain percentage, not full. Uh, some of them started with 20% uh, operations, and until now, most of the uh, BPOs and contact centers are, I think, are mixing the work from home uh, working strategy, and uh, about 20% of that is work from open, uh, office. So uh, the other sectors on outsourcing are banking and finance, e-commerce, and logistics. While on healthcare, they continue to operate. Of course, um, they are actually called frontliners. They are essential part of uh, the COVID-19 control and prevention. Uh, treatment. So, so the hospital is the critical part of that, the clinics, dental services, and optometry uh, and other healthcare related uh, uh, establishment uh, continue to operate at that time. And other services like uh, for Santos Night Park facilities management, we had been supporting this critical establishment, this essential establishment all throughout. Uh, we've been reporting to work from since day one, and we continue to support them until the new normal. So uh, utilities company are still working at that time, even telecoms, data centers, um, and internet providers, and media, of course. And all the uh, supporting uh, third-party repair services uh, to support all of these uh, uh, operate, uh, essential establishments uh, that needs to run because they have particular equipment. They, they are also in such a part of the the, the, the sectors that, have, that needs to operate at that time. So moving forward is uh, on the next slide. So, uh, so when we went into reopening the, uh, the economy again, uh, going to the general community quarantine, uh, every, uh, the, 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 every company and every establishment that wants to operate uh, needs to rethink how do they occupy the space. So they, there are uh, four basic uh, essential pillars that was uh, uh, as a basis of their occupancy strategies for most of the companies. One is the BCP. There's no exact and uh, quite fitting BCP strategies that can combat the COVID-19 because it's basically unprecedented, no one had prepared for it, but parts and parcel of that BCP strategy, the other companies are able to utilize that. Like for some of the contact centers, they have relationship with, an, uh, with hotels and apartments. So they, they were able to capitalize on that relationship, that contract, so that uh, uh, it had been uh, the, the, uh, 
it had been used as the accommodation of their employees. And, uh, and mostly uh, the other pillars, which is the basis of the recommendation strategies of the establishment that needs to reopen are DOH, the IAPF or the interagency task force that was uh, promulgated by the government and also DOLE, uh, which uh, DOLE currently has about 26 uh, 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 labor advisory already and most of it are related to COVID-19 uh, control and uh, prevention. So in terms of those four pillars, four essential pillars, the, the, the most of the companies had uh, work on four classifications, mainly uh, first stage is the work analysis. Second would be facility adjustments. Uh, so then sustaining the operations. And, there, and uh, the fourth one is progression and continuity. So going to, so, uh, going to the next slide, which details the workforce analysis. So most of the, the following slide, I will basically enumerate all the strategies that was um, implemented by the establishment that we opened, uh, those uh, establishments that we also work uh, to resume the, the, the retreat take up of the space. And uh, these are the current experience on workforce analysis. So from, from uh, before going into the space, um, what the, most of the companies did is a survey to know basically what are the essential people or the classification of a workforce that needs to be uh, going to the uh, uh, if uh, going to the next point is the identifying the, the, the ones that needs the physical presence. Uh, th those that are essential in returning back to office and mixing it together with uh, what needs to go into the work from home, to stay working from home. Uh, so basically, uh, this survey uh, will uh, uncover uh, what there's the employee conditions at that particular uh, moment. Uh, basically, following the IATF guidelines for comorbidity, if certain employees has comorbidity, pre-illness, if they have high risk individuals that is uh, uh, also located in the same house, they will not be, uh, they are candidates to stay working from home. Uh, for, and also part of the work analysis is the available resources to enable the, uh, the, the current workforce to going back to the office. So namely uh, the analysis whether where, where to get shuttle services, the transportation, and also the logistics like uh, also for the work from home, how do you make this, those uh, laptops, those uh, uh, other logistics to enable the, the functionality of uh, the work at home? And also, uh, once you go from, from work from home, uh, the concerns about if there is an access in terms of internet, uh, if there is a, it has a reliable connectivity to perform work. So this Basically, the, this particular survey is looking for two objectives in order to define your working capacity and while uh, looking on the safety of all the individuals that are going to report to work. So uh, with workforce analysis, you'll be able to uh, know what's, the, what's the, the new capacity, the FTE that can be accommodated by the, the space while also following the guidelines set by the government in terms of social distancing. So going to the next slide. So after the workforce analysis is the facility adjustments. So this is basically uh, an analysis of the office layout, uh, identifying what are the high risk areas, uh, those that, has, uh, that are commonly used like pantries before and high traffic areas uh, like restrooms and all wherein there is a high risk of uh, uh, having contact with an infected uh, COVID-19 uh, individual. So, uh, so the, the office layout analysis will help you to control and prevent the, the propagation of the COVID-19 in the workplace. And uh, the next one is the, the facility adjustment in terms of reconfigura uh, reconfiguration of the space the need to repurposing some of the available space like meeting rooms, since uh, it, been, it can be converted now into an office 
like pantries, you can also use that. So there's a lot of uh, reconfiguration in order to increase the uh, space capacity to accommodate more individuals or more workers in the workplace. Um, installation, of, uh, as you can see, um, there are certain establishments that you look into having acrylic shields and barriers. These are uh, the, 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 uh, an area wherein more of the transaction is happening, like uh, money transactions on accounting, purchasing, and uh, for banking sectors, they, they put in installation, of, uh, they install acrylic shields and barriers to prevent and basically control the infection. Then the next one is the, uh, the manpower uh, reporting strategy, which is uh, this, uh, basically rationalizing uh, what is the mix of work from home and uh, physical presence and uh, looking into your uh, ro uh, manpower roster who's going to report the work. And uh, on the manpower strategy, we saw in some of the establishment like for telecoms, for data centers, for hospitals, for manufacturing, which usually runs on the 24 by 7 uh, operation, they can afford a split operations methodology uh, wherein they can uh, build a team A, team B, team C, team D, uh, in order, and, and, and this particular team, the objective is that, that no particular time and uh, on a particular space that they get, get to be seeing each other. So, uh, so uh, it had been proven and we have observed that uh, this is the most resilient strategy that had been employed uh, by most of the companies that is working 24 by 7 and who can afford having a team E, team A, team B, team C on their workplace. Because uh, as experienced, uh, we had uh, all throughout this, uh, from the start of the laptop, uh, we experienced that uh, a lot of manpower have also uh, acquired the COVID-19. And, uh, and uh, what we saw with the speed operations methodology, once the, a single person had been uh, positive about, uh, and acquired the disease, the other, members of that team needs to go in quarantine. And it was easy to, uh, to re-strategize uh, calling the other teams to come into the office and replace the ones that need to go in quarantine. So this, this is the most resilient strategy that we have observed so far in terms of uh, manpower roster analysis. So next slide is uh, sustaining operations. So sustaining operations is consistent. So on the usage of the IATF protocols, as you can observe, every establishment that these were open, they were ready about thermal gun and scanners. Uh, scanners are more uh, better technology uh, if you can afford one. Uh, these are the, the scanners you can actually, you can monitor several people in one screen, uh, as long as it's fronted in the camera. So these, they, they have the functionality to spot uh, each individual that is in front of the camera having that particular, the, the, the current temperature. And also the usage of the daily health declaration wherein uh, uh, every person that would come into the establishment would need to declare what is the health condition that they carry in. Do his, do he or, is he or her uh, currently uh, experiencing some symptoms of the COVID-19? So they, they, they can be prevented from coming uh, into the office and getting infect, uh, infected the, the other uh, colleagues that they have. So other, uh, also, et cetera, in terms of other implementation consistent to uh, IATF. Then the second one is the specific office guidelines and protocols. We, uh, in terms, this is very critical in, in terms of um, uh, specific guidelines to follow in, uh, for, for the offices in terms of once a, uh, once an identified person had been infected, had been confirmed to be COVID positive, what would be the protocols that needs to be executed by the office and how do you do the contact tracing? So this is uh, one of the, the, the critical things. Uh, the, the, the key on this one is acting very fast. So um, all, um, a guidelines and a ready protocol will assist you on acting and making the decision faster. And the uh, supply of hygiene items like PPE, the PPEs, the masks, the face shields, uh, these have been uh, provided to uh, the, the 
uh, employees so that uh, it can prevent the, it, can, it also helps on the prevention and control of COVID-19. Uh, of course, uh, the, the other establishment, uh, the provision of shuttle services, the transportation that they can uh, provide to support their operations and sustain it. The office tools and resources for work from home, uh, like for contact centers, majority of them had acquired the permit in PESA uh, to uh, relocate their, uh, their laptops, their desktops, even their desktops at home of the employees that they have. So they, they went through that trouble in order to enable uh, the, the working from home. And the uh, next bullet is the arrangement and accommodation of employees we're in the, like like the uh, putting uh, some of the workforce on hotels and apartments that was arranged by the establishment and uh, one is the the last bullet here is rapid testing uh, if you can remember this was the option that was uh, working for each of the establishment that this story opened back in may 16th because primarily May, um, the, on May 16th, the PCR tests are not really that available at that moment. So uh, the, most of the companies relied on rapid testing. It was appropriate at the time because uh, uh, it was quick, the results are quick. And uh, depending on the accuracy of the rapid test that is used, uh, we can uh, have some confidence uh, about the current health status of the employees that are going to report on the workplace. But now the rapid testing, uh, most of the uh, healthcare professional are against it because uh, they, they're saying that uh, it's not really um, discovering whether there's really a virus, but rather uh, the rapid testing is uh, only looking for the uh, the antibodies for uh, for the individuals who supposedly had acquired the COVID-19. So they are saying that it's not an accurate, the, still the preferred method for knowing who had acquired the disease is swabbing or the PCR test. And going to the next slide, we're in uh, for the sustaining operations. So various sanitation treatments have been performed uh, on uh, the, the establishment that we know. So they, uh, every day, uh, all of the establishment that uh, have employees reporting for work had, had uh, a daily office deep cleaning, uh, a kind of surface sanitation being done also by their housekeeping or third party uh, service providers who are really expert on doing the deep cleaning. And uh, also uh, some of the third parties are also capable of doing ultra, uh, ultra low volume fagging wherein they use disinfectants to, uh, to destroy the characteristic of the viruses that, uh, that is present in the office. Uh, ultra low volume fogging are also used on uh, the shuttle services so that uh, uh, in order to sanitize the whole, uh, the whole car so that uh, once you transport and then once the, the people ride on it, the employees are protected. Air purifiers are uh, uh, not all air purifiers are effective. They are there to introduce better air quality, introduce air quality. Those that have a HEPA filter HEPA, uh, are the ones that, they can, that can help uh, in terms of sanitizing and protecting the, the employees against viruses. Um, so that are the air purifiers that you need to look on into. Uh, the other technologies that are currently present and are being uh, used by the establishment currently are the ultraviolet C lamps uh, and also the UV ozone or the ozonizer. Uh, both of these technologies currently present, they are both a uh, potent way of uh, destroying the viruses that are, and pathogens that are currently present in uh, the workspace. Unfortunately, uh, in order to do this, uh, uh, it's recommended that there should be no people around uh, while you're doing this particular treatment. So it's it's kind uh, it, it's kind of uh, have some health implications if ever people will be present and doing the treatment at the same time. So uh, the other and the last one on in terms of uh, the sanitation treatment that we have saw uh, in part of the uh, the strategies for making the workplace safe and healthy is the, uh, the ACU cleaning and treatment. 
So um, yeah, uh, making sure that uh, you'll be able to introduce more fresh air uh, into the workspace. There will be air currents move, uh, that is present on the working space. You need to have those uh, droplets to be uh, flushed out immediately out of the, the working space. So these are the strategies that uh, that have been employed so far by the establishment that we know and we are currently helping with. So the last slide on the presentation is progression. Uh, or how do you maintain, how do you move forward uh, in terms of putting the proper strategy in the workplace? So uh, we are observing, uh, most of the establishments are observing continuous compliance to the IATF and DOH guidelines. It's, uh, we saw that uh, uh, there are improvements in additional guidelines uh, uh, that is being put by the government as we move forward in the new normal. Also, the second one is the continuous data gathering and analysis of the workspace. Uh, what is not currently present, what is available in the market in terms of strategy, and what needs to be put in in order to prevent the diseases and affecting the employees. Then, uh, as we know, uh, we have been updating the BCP that suits the health pandemic. So now, uh, modifying uh, the, the current BCP, the old BCP, and integrating it with uh, the appropriate actions in to combat COVID-19 and uh, hopefully, uh, all, uh, uh, be able to update uh, your resiliency strategy uh, towards uh, pandemics. And lastly, is uh, the strategies that have been put by uh, the establishment currently are the ensuring the wellness for both uh, physical facility and also mental wellness of the employees. So uh, we saw uh, on multinational companies and other industries that they have partnered with third party consultancy uh, service providers that uh, that, uh, uh, that enables their employees to consult and also share their anxiety on what's going on someone some someone to talk to and uh, and uh, be able to uh, maintain their mental wellness so these are the strategies that have been put in and uh, we saw uh, on the current uh, implement uh, the, the current resumption of work uh, had what have been implemented by the establishment that we uh, that we saw and we had helped uh, during this uh, uh, lockdown and moving forward. So uh, that ends the presentation. What, what we I hope that you can uh, uh, get one or two strategies uh, that you can actually implement on your working space. If ever there, it's not yet present, but these are the things that uh, we saw currently being uh, uh, implemented uh, with the current establishment that we have. And uh, as you can see from the last pictures, ever since uh, the, the, the start of the lockdown until now, uh, all our workers as an uh, facilities management, the property management had been present. We have been a critical part of the continuity of the operation of the critical establishment mentioned earlier. So we continue to provide these services and this uh, malasakit uh, 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 advocacy in our workplace and the, the clients that we currently handle. So if ever you need uh, our uh, help, uh, please, uh, you can go and get, uh, you, you, you have our contacts, so please get hold of Hold of us. Thank you. Back to you, Rick. Dennis, thanks so much for your insights and uh, and very, very much appreciated. And thanks for all your work, hard work you're doing there on the front lines. Our next speaker is Sat Satesh Rajendran. He's the Chief Operating Officer and Head of Facilities and Asset, Asset Manager for Knight Frank in India. Satish is a, is a highly respected leader in the Indian business community and an INSEAD alumnus. He has over 18 years of rich experience in corporate real estate. He heads consultancy, facilities management, asset management, um, and uh, for Knight Frank in India. And he also sits on the Occupier Services Board for APAC. And currently Satish is, the global, uh, is on the Global Board of Directors for Cornet Globally. Uh, and just uh, Satish works closely with our team, Morgan McGilvery, Francis Ganio, Abby De Silva, Jason Abraham, Christine Devera, Ray Sanchez, Nino Tio, and Cash Salvador. Uh, we were some of the founders of Cornet 
uh, in the Philippines, and so we are very much behind Cornet. Uh, you know, we established the uh, the CBRE brand here, built it up, and then we transitioned our brand to Knight Frank in 2017. And also, I'd worked for Jones Lang in London. But let me tell you, of all the corporate real estate professionals I've met, Satish is one of the best minds and one of the key reasons, uh, along with Knight Frank and Andy, why we bought why we brought our, our platform of 1,500 people over tonight, Frank. So, Satish, over to you, my friend, genius. Um, thanks, Rick, uh, for the wonderful uh, introduction uh, and very good morning to all of you. It's always nice to hear from my friend Dennis about the best practices uh, followed in Philippines on reoccupancy, especially from the backdrop of uh, COVID challenges, which uh, we all are going through. And also, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Cecilia for setting this context uh, of this webinar. Thank you, sir. I now take uh, this opportunity to present the India experience of reoccupancy and few of the best practices that we follow. But having said that, both Philippines and India markets are more or less the same. Fortunate uh, that uh, both our clients are common. So uh, the business is very much uh, the same as what uh, uh, Dennis rep uh, represented. So while we agree that the office uh, workspace uh, and remote working continue to be more effective, at the same time, it's important for us to ensure safe workspace to build employee confidence. So that is the uh, need of the R, you know, to remove the fear and anxieties of the people. In India, when it comes to workplace reoccupancy post-COVID, there are significant long-term changes and best practices to ensure business continuity. The reopening of the workspaces has started from the month of May 2020, with stringent guidelines rolled out by Government of India. And the same has been followed across the country by everybody. Also, India has witnessed quick comeback during unlock phases, with 90% of industrial segment, over 60% of commercial segment, of which between 8 to 10% of re reoccupancy from the occupier segment, and up to around 30% of employees returned to work. Further, the reoccupancy is expected to be at 50% by end of the year 2020. So. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. So in this uh, in this context, uh, our approach for reoccupancy is based on the guidelines that are defined by World Health Organization, Center for Disease Control, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, Government Advisories, Guidelines and Directions, and more importantly, international consultants like us, Mike Frank, who has customized SOPs for our occupied clients. So overall, these are the sources that bring the awareness about the virus and what is the proactive measures, recommendations, and best practices. Moving to the next slide, please. Right. So as we know, the occupancy post the pandemic has become the biggest business challenges for everybody, especially the property real estate community. Hence, at a strategic level, it is very important for us to adapt some of the key guiding principles from the end user point of view, and also some essential considerations to plan our return of operations. So what are those three guiding principles has now become the cornerstone in defining the return of work strategy? That is defining the new normal and adopting to the uh, new normal, building confidence of the employees by quelling their fears and anxieties, Prevention of occupation as well by ensuring a clean, safe, and hygiene workplace. So it's also very important to plan our business continuity, keeping in mind the seven essential considerations on the right-hand side of the uh, slide. Those are manage employee numbers, limit number of employees working from office as per the guidelines issued by Government of India, the maintain remote workings, working in office will have a degree of remoteness amongst employees. Rethink physical setup. It's important to plan, reorient the seating arrangements for social distancing and identify zones with high, medium, and low risk. Rebuild workplace model. Confidence needs to be rebuilt. Empathy, empathy will be the new watchword for everybody. And as we all know, successful businesses thrive on motivated workforces. So it is important that leaders invest in efforts to rebuild employee and workplace morale. Review infrastructure needs, very important. Required technology platform to be really strengthened. 
maintain regular communication today communication is must at all levels the value of right information will be the need of the hour to avoid any negativity in the work environment and lastly embed your learnings every day brings a new learning hence it's important for us to upgrade and incorporate new learnings in our business architecture and operational procedures followed by regular training sessions to ensure the new norms and guidance are adapted and followed for all our clients should you go to next slide please right so so far all i spoke was on the strategy that is followed to reset the reoccupancy at workplace and now we come to the tactical part of our business that is the best practices for business continuity which will address the 360 degree aspects of corporate real estate fm focusing on reopening workspaces especially building confidence for employees clients partners and all the other stakeholders as most of us know today environmental changes are easier and straightforward but behavioral changes will take time to develop therefore it is very important with the help of training and most importantly constant communication is something very important so keeping in mind the new normal now some of these aspects and best practices that will be now be considered as part of business continuity in built environment before employees return to work i'll just get into the more detail can you go to the next slide please right so uh, it is building access right it is very important for us to have a revised guidelines will need to be published to the building access to our employees visitors and vendor partners such as employees to pass through the temperature scanners no visitors further notifications or meeting visitors only in the building lobby one at a time vendors to fill self self declarations post passing through the temperature scanner and get the same approved by the building safety officer two best practices on building common areas like restricted entry amenity spaces and breakout areas till further notification frequent sanitization of common and shared spaces with hygiene cleaning schedules for all touch points clearly no smoking zone in the campus strict vigilant by a print task force team for monitoring the protocol during employee movement in the common areas cleaning protocols for cleaning staff is very important especially from the staff cleaning safety protocols and providing the adequate ppes like nose mask hand gloves sanitization kit while cleaning is very important and some of the best practices on air filtration all hus filters to be sanitized before putting into operations and we can also use the use of technology for uv candles or clean air can you move to the next slide please few protocols that can be followed as part of business continuity when it comes to space capacity overlay rotate the groups enclosed spaces can potentially be useful as individual workplaces bring 2 meter distance norm to ensure open spaces for example employee shall be allowed to sit in alternative workstation determine the maximum capacity of larger meeting rooms by maintaining social distancing norm and for that matter in cafeteria separation between tables with single seaters use queue managers on floors with 2 meter separation marking for the coffee or microwaves or water points and etc and lastly very important have a occupancy strategy matching the capacity and demand so when it comes to risk overlay identify high risk areas with higher cleaning frequency typical high risk areas are lift lobbies reception waiting areas washrooms storage and such areas identify high risk intersections circulation paths where staff come within proximity as they move through the office may look for regulated movement plan to avoid proximity identify medium risk areas too where people meet more on scheduled basis such as meeting rooms storage spaces and high touch devices and spaces to be identified and have sanitizing schedules in place low risk areas like workstation cabins individual spaces that are occupied by one person during the day or shift schedule for sanitizing shall be in place with prescribed frequency task force deploy trained task force with required mix and match of team members exclusively for code scenario based on the task and ensure frequent training to the task force to deliver the intended outcome in the premises have a communication tree with all relevant stakeholders 
whether it's EHS or operations or CREs, all the business stakeholders. And by having a dedicated help desk to address co-related grievance and etc. The next slide, please. Managing employer anxiety. It's very important, right? That's what we've been talking from the beginning. So, so far, all the best practices that I spoke on previous slides will cover as part of business continuity. Now, we will discuss the most important part of employees' behavioral aspect and best practices that will help willing employees' fears and anxiety. And that's when there is a need to address this quickly. Because as you all know, the most valuable thing for all of us today is human asset and to bring them back to work, which will certainly require a visionary or strategic vision. Just to give you a statistic of a recent survey, it was interesting to note that the survey that was conducted by WHO in March end revealed 41% of employees were afraid to go to work only because of the risk of exposure. Hence, for us as a CRE, in CRE, it becomes paramount to address and manage these employees' anxieties such as inadequacy, fear that office is not ready and safe, change is difficult today. The employee needs to be quickly moved from a denial mode to an acceptance mode to adapt to the changes quickly. Uncertainty, what will happen to my future? Jobs, roles, all this is become today reality. Judgment, in these situations, the fear of judgment by others will be a major concern. So every decision will have a repercussion. Missing out. In this rapid changing scenario, the pressure of wanting to be the first mover to take advantage might prevail. Adversity, dealing with misinformation, travel, safety. So keeping all this in mind, it's important that we manage employee emotions and build confidence. So how do we do that? Next slide. Next slide. Please. Here are some of the best practices that has been adopted and followed uh, for, uh, improving the, uh, for the better morale and also to improve their productivity at workplace. Today, employee assistance program and online courses to ensure this stress management, which people are going through, uh, deal, dealing with loss, improving personal resiliences. So it's very important to bring them engaged by having motivational talks, employee engagement, especially fun activities. And this is a time that we have to reward and recognize the brave hearts Who's, uh, who's been a uh, frontliner today. So all this makes a big difference in, in bringing the uh, workforce back to the workplace. On-site virtual mental wellness, meditation is really helps. Promote healthy building principles uh, of, for ventilation, air quality, water quality, noise, and lighting, etc. And lastly, very important, adopt new regimes for workplace cleanliness, like cleaning and sanitization. So my last second slide, uh, next slide, please. It's very important for employers to focus on key principles which would make remote workplaces more efficient for employees. Some of them identify ways of working to manage employer to meet employee expectations and build culture of collaboration. Build comprehensive economic programs and office, uh, uh, the home office system support to ensure that remote working goes well. Provide right tools and process to support remote working throughout employee journey, from hiring to exiting. And more importantly, invest in virtual communications and collaboration with technology to support work from home. And my next slide is my last slide. With this slide, I would want to conclude my presentation with a closing statement. That is, reoccupancy and remote working practice on basis of renewed strategy tactical approach, operational protocol, and best practices to ensure safe and productive work environment. So with this, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for your patience and attention in hearing out to me about our India experiences. Over to you, Rick. Satish, thanks so much for that very insightful, uh, basically, commentary. And, and, uh, and just to, to, to go along the same lines of further discussion, you see some headlines the office space is dead, you know, what's the future of office space looking like? I, I guess the question to you is, if you, the difference between work from home in emerge versus emerging markets, I was on on phone with Midnight with a uh, Harvard Business School professor last night, he said, you know, the Gini coefficient says that 
in rich societies, the higher you are in the, in the income brackets, the better or the ability for work at home to work. The, the, the lower you get down the scale or in emerging markets, it doesn't really work. So your feedback on that. Uh, uh, so Rick, today it's all about the perception, right? Today, everybody is worried about economy globally, not just in your uh, Philippines. Everybody's sentiments are very low. So, but there's a, it's a perception saying the way, the, where there is a challenge, there is also an opportunities. If you see, uh, you know, uh, we have no other option, right? We can't wait till the vaccine comes and we all are back to the normal. Today, we have to live with the uh, way how it is. And because today, livelihood has become a big challenge for the middle class uh, people. So, I, I see whatever the interaction, what I have with a few of the global occupiers, they are pretty positive. Yes, there is a slowdown and what's happening because of the challenges which we all are going through. But certainly all this is only till, yes, the, certainly this entire year is gone. Yes, in terms of revenue, profitability or business, that has really uh, taken a hit. But I see uh, with the interaction, what I've seen, it will bounce back. This sector is going to bounce back. Yes, uh, uh, in fact, people have moved to a different business modules. They want to bring down the cost, how, how better we can uh, bring technology and bring efficiency towards it, but nothing is stopping. It's all an interim. So I feel uh, uh, that, you know, it's uh, just uh, this year and by the coming year, I could see that lots of occupiers. The one good thing about is occupiers, investors and developers all have become very flexible. Certainly it's an occupiers market now. There are lots of advantage, but I could see that uh, commercial developers and investors are becoming very flexible to adjust and, uh, you know, provide solutions to the need of the occupiers. So uh, I, I'm pretty confident on the way how the market will bounce back in the coming year, but certainly it is slow down. Yeah, Satish, I agree. And I, I think the, uh, at least there are transactions happening internationally. I was talking tonight, Frank, San Francisco office and transactions there had really slowed down. But I think at some point it's clear this will all end. And I know that we helped pioneer the call center BPO outsourcing sector here in the wake of the financial crisis. If it wasn't for 1997 and in in office space right. didn't get plentiful and cheap, people didn't get plentiful and cheap and, and, and access, et cetera, with the currency depreciating here, it became the perfect environment for outsourcing. Now we have an industry in the Philippines that deploys, you know, over one and a half million people and 26 billion revenue, another, you know, there four or five billion spin-off jobs. I mean, so do you see this situation now as an opportunity? Absolutely. I think, uh, uh, you know, see, we, there's no option for us to be very negative, right? You know, uh, uh, it, it required some brave decisions, which I've seen, I've witnessed, uh, we have closed some big deals in India. We have seen a couple of uh, big occupiers expanding their office space. Yes, some of them are uh, uh, rethinking about their overall uh, uh, strategy and they're redesigning their workspaces. Work is happening. But the only point at this moment is uh, what scale? That is something that, uh, you know, it's time for all the stakeholders to sit over the table proactively in a partnership approach, see how we can build a strategy for next two or three years or a five years, depending upon our plan, and see how we can benefit from the both the sides of the market. So I feel uh, it is time for us to come openly, collaborate as partners, and see how we can bring down the cost uh, without compromising in efficiency uh, and the productive of the workplace. No, I, I fully agree. I know that Morgan McGilvery and uh, and um, and Francis Gani here have, have closed some of the, our largest kind of transactions ever in the Philippine markets. Uh, sure, those were hangovers from last year coming into this year, but they still completed. So we are optimistic. Satish, thanks so much for your your insight, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to do another follow up with the team. So very good. Thank you again. Thanks, Satish. Thank you very much. Uh, aside from physical space, companies are also looking at the human productivity side and greater remote working, uh, working to address COVID-19 challenges. How do companies strike the right balance between productivity and safety? Our next speaker uh, is the Deputy Director of Harrison Profiles International, which provides the award-winning Harrison assessments in the Philippines. Uh, Christian Chum Carino, uh, having trained under Dr. Harrison himself, the founder of Harrison Assessments, Chum provides Harrison solutions to organizations, including the top 30 publicly listed companies in the Philippines, including Jollibee, the Aboites Group, multinationals like Watson's, AXA, government institutions like the Philippine Central Bank and the GSIS. You know, Santos Knight Frank ourselves extensively use the Harrison Assessments. Chum helps clients affect the impactful recruitment 
and development strategies through successful talent acquisition, customization of competencies, and executive coaching, uh, amongst others. So welcome, Chung. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Rick. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak um, about Tyrosin assessments and how uh, talent analytics can help uh, organizations um, in this work environment. So I was listening into Satish's um, uh, presentation a while ago, and he touched on a few points that I'd like to delve in a bit deeper. Um, he discussed the behavioral aspect, also the human aspect. And so with the Harrison assessments, um, we've recently developed um, new remote workforce analytics reports um, to really look at how um, we can better support um, the remote worker, but at the same time, how can organizations implement effective reoccupancy strategies and plans? And so moving on to my next slide, um, I'd like to pose three important questions first when implementing a remote workforce strategy. The first being, uh, who and how many of these people working in your organization can actually work from home? How can they, uh, how, what are the metrics that are being uh, measured uh, to, to um, see uh, the capacity of how they can uh, effectively work in this new environment? Uh, we also have to look at the leaders, the leaders managing these remote workers. What's their leadership style like? Can they make these behavioral tweaks to adjust uh, to this environment and to help better um, promote uh, their people to succeed in this new environment? And finally, um, the third question is, how can talent analytics such as Harrison Assessments uh, help your organization decide how many of your employers, uh, sorry, employees uh, should work off-site versus on-site? And so in the next slide, um, I'd like to just give a brief background of who Harrison Assessments is and what we do. Um, we have a photo here for our founder and CEO, Dr. Dan Harrison, uh, who in 1990 um, decided that he wanted to uh, help individuals and companies select and develop top talent. And so as a result, what happened was he created this assessment tool that measures 175 factors, uh, both positive and negative. Um, this is currently being used by half a million users per year uh, in 61 countries around the world. Uh, the questionnaire only really takes 20 uh, minutes to complete, um, and we're actually screening for that 175 factors that I mentioned previously. Uh, the, the questionnaire can be translated into 44 different languages, um, and as it was founded in 1990, there's 30 years of validation research. Um, Rick mentioned in uh, my introduction that um, the companies uh, that are using Harrison in the Philippines, uh, two that are publicly listed as one of the top companies in the Philippines are the Amboyges Group of Companies, as well as the Jollibee Group, uh, who also have now international presence in, in uh, the global space. Uh, and they've been using this for the last 20 years now. In my next slide, uh, I'd like to discuss what are these different challenges uh, that people are experiencing in the remote work environment. And so if you have a look on the right side, I've just put some points there. Um, and maybe some of you might also agree with these things as you may be experiencing them, but you may not find that all of this um, affect you. So the first five points really look at uh, the task-oriented um, things that the person needs to do in this remote work environment. You know, we find that there could be a lack of self-discipline as there's so many distractions at home that are not present in the uh, office space. You know, the lack of structure um, is causing people to have a lot of unclarity, especially with deliverables. Um, we find that because everything now is so important, the prioritizing of tasks uh, tends to be put on the back burner. And we know you start to tend to lose the force for the trees when that happens. On the other side, the next four points um, that I put down there um, deal with the interpersonal related factors um, of the challenges that people are facing in this remote environment. You know, a lot of people are social by nature, outgoing. And so to take that away all of a sudden would tend to cause feelings of isolation. Um, and that is quite hard for certain people. Um, at the moment, you know, managing different kinds of interruptions from the, from the household. You know, you've got now families, children, pets are, you know, uh, a factor to consider um, when working from home. You know, the lines are kind of getting blurred now from the personal and professional life. People are having a hard time being able to switch on and off. Um, which leads to a lot of um, you know, physical uh, and mental health issues, uh, which also leads into burnout. And so as a result of this, uh, in the next slide, um, these challenges um, you know, are being faced by different people and that one size fits all uh, approach is not gonna work here. And so the Harrison assessments um, 
uh, analytics, we have a, a work preference questionnaire that we give to an individual. As I mentioned a while ago, it only takes about 20 minutes to complete. You can answer it online anytime, anywhere, uh, in, in several ways. Uh, you can do it on your laptop, your cell phone, your tablet. And the, the uh, assessment um, is posted in a positive stated way. Everything is positively stated. And the individual is asked to stack rank these statements into groups of eight. Uh, the items appear twice in each group just to check for consistency and reliability. And if you have a look here, here are some sample statements that we ask uh, these individuals to answer. So the first one being, I am quite optimistic. Second, I enjoy analyzing problems and decisions. Uh, third is, I enjoy meeting and mixing with many new people. Uh, and the last would be, uh, I would enjoy working outdoors. So here we get the candidate to rank these questions um, from most important to least important. And then so we get an understanding of what are their natural behavioral preferences and tendencies. Um, and from that, we're looking at that 175 factors that I mentioned a while ago, um, some positive and some counterproductive. Uh, now, just moving on to the next slide. So as a result of the pandemic, uh, Harrison has created two uh, remote work behavioral competencies. One report will look at the remote worker, while the other looks at the remote leader managing the remote worker. Now, this is a sample on the left-hand side of an overview report um, that looks at two different factors. Um, one is remote productivity, and that's for the remote worker. Um, but the other report that looks at the leaders looks at how the leader manages remote productivity. So under um, remote productivity here, we tend to look at how the individual stays focused and productive um, while working in a remote environment. Um, can they be autonomous and do they take the initiative to persist while there's constant distractions happening around them? How do they maintain order? Um, how do they stay focused on their goals? And do they ma maintain that positive attitude um, that will really enable them to um, self-improve in this um, environment? Um, the next report that we also have a look at is how do these individuals um, handle remote communication? Um, so with remote communication, do they have the initiative to communicate and collaborate with people to affect efficiencies? Do they maintain those positive attitudes um, and listen with an open mind, especially when feedback is being given? Um, do they take things personally or not? Or do they take this um, as a way to improve? You know, communication is a two-way street, I always say. Um, you have to be straightforward and to the point, but at the same time, you need to maintain that respect and be sensitive to others. And so while looking at these two reports, the individual will have a score for both of those um, competencies. And as you notice, there's a overall percentage of suitability fit that would make up the scores of those two reports. Now here we have a case where Mr. Andrew Jones is being looked at under the lens of a remote work um, report. And we can see that there's an overall percentage of suitability fit of 84%, which would indicate that he has the right behavioral competencies to work in a remote workforce environment. Now, if his scores dip below 75%, then that's going to change to yellow, um, which would indicate that there could be certain challenges now that he could be facing, but still could manage to work effectively in that uh, environment. And if you have scores that dip below the 60 percentile mark, that's going to turn red, which would indicate that there's probable lack of competence ready and this individual might really be struggling in this new um, remote environment. And so in the next slide, when we drill down deeper, we have a look at um, the remote worker, but at the same time, the leaders managing that remote worker. So for the remote worker, we have to find out, can we compare their behavioral preferences and tendencies to those that will most likely produce positive outcomes in this new environment? Well, when we're looking at the remote leader, we have to ask the question, what are these insights we get uh, to be able to see if these leaders can effectively change their management style um, and make these behavioral uh, tweaks and adjustments to better help the workers that they're managing, the team, as well as the whole organizational performance. Now, on the left side, this is a sample of one of the um, remote leadership analysis reports. Um, it's a bit small, but I'll try to sort of um, explain what it, uh, what it does. As you notice, there's still that overall thermometer. Uh, at the moment, it's showing that it's red, which would indicate that Mr. Andrew Jones would have an overall um, you know, lack of competency managing the remote productivity of the workers. And so, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, we're looking at 175 factors, and we've selected traits um, that would be needed to be essential to, uh, for the individual to score high in um, so that they'll be effective uh, in this environment. 
And so an example would be takes initiative. Um, so this is when a person is able to do things without being told what to do um, and to effectively um, uh, get things done. But at the same time, when we're looking at the report as a whole, uh, at the very bottom, you see that uh, we also look for traits to avoid. These are behavioral factors that if a person has a tendency um, to have it, it could um, cause some significant issues um, in that competency. And the example there is uh, permissive, where we can see that there's a substantial uh, negative impact. Now, a person who is permissive uh, tends to have issues with holding people accountable, uh, enforcing necessary rules to be followed. And if you look at it, if a manager is uh, permissive, um, then it's quite hard for them to manage the remote worker uh, and their productivity. So at least these reports give um, insight as to the individual and their specific behavioral preferences and tendencies. So we can make better informed decisions of how to support them, uh, but at the same time, how can we use this to uh, implement effective workplace strategies um, when we're going back to reoccupancy? Uh, the next slide, um, we actually did a case study running these uh, two competency reports um, with a local BPO here in the Philippines. Um, so we still have that sort of stoplight methodology here. Green means that there's a probable competence anywhere where they score between 75 to 100%. Uh, yellow would indicate that there is a probable competence where they score between 60 to 74%. And then finally, if they're scoring below 60%, then we can say that there's a lack of competence there. Uh, on the left uh, pie chart, you can see that we have looked at 87 uh, individuals within that uh, BPO um, organization, uh, which is a mix between workers and leaders. Um, looking at the data, 58% of these um, individuals show that 66% of them are in the green zone, which would indicate that, yes, um, the most part of the population is already uh, have the right behaviors to work in this new remote work environment. However, in saying that, when we're looking at the other data, we can see that a little over 30% are now tending to find that there could be some uh, areas of challenges and difficulties. And so then at least we can see who are these individuals and what are these factors that are affecting them? How can we better help support them? And can we build more effective strategies when we reintroduce them to the workplace? Now, looking at the two pie charts, um, if you can just guess who between the leaders and the workers um, are having more of a difficult time in this new remote work environment, um, I'll discuss that later on. But, you know, looking at the middle uh, chart, we can see that 77% of the workers, uh, sorry, 77 of the workers, uh, 54 of them are actually falling in the green zone, which would indicate that uh, they are actually um, able to do this remote work uh, based on their behavioral preferences. Um, yellows, the yellow zones, the red zones, again, it sort of mimics the, the greater pool of the, um, the study where they are um, facing issues. But when we drill down, you'll see that um, the remote productivity score and the remote communication score, um, there is an average uh, percentage there that the workers are in the 74th percentile, and which is nearly in the green zone. Um, so that's quite good as an indication to say that they have the right behaviors. But we can see that there are certain behavioral challenges that they may be facing at the moment. Uh, same with their um, remote communication at 73%. Now on the last pie chart, um, you can see here that um, you know, it's really the leaders that are probably um, finding it hard to manage the remote productivity and manage the remote communication of the workers. Um, as we only had 40% fall within the green zone, 50% um, um, were in the yellow zone and 10% uh, uh, of them were probably having a difficult time here. Uh, drilling down into the data, you can see here that um, with manage, between managing remote productivity and managing remote communication, the bigger issue that they probably are facing is the management of remote communication. And so with this data, it's always good to drill down and see what are these sort of traits in common and how can we use that data to make um, better programs to help support our people. And so in the next slide, I've... Um, look at what are the traits in common within the sample group, um, within this case study. And the first set, uh, we'll try to look at the common traits, the common Harrison traits of these remote workers. So first I'd like to point out on the left-hand side, what are these areas of strength that are in common with these people that are helping them to work um, effectively in this um, environment? And we find that people that score seven to 10, at least with the traits of being enthusiastic, um, enthusiastic is the tendency to be eager um, with one's own goals. 
Um, they're also scored high in being collaborative, which is the tendency to collaborate with others when making decisions. And then finally, a high score in self-improvement would indicate that these people have the tendency to attempt uh, to better develop um, themselves. And so these traits here, we can see that a high score will probably aid them in their success in this new environment. But in saying that, um, there are also areas um, where they scored low to moderate, which could be looked at as areas of development. Um, these scores uh, between two to six, which are um, relatively low, we see first that uh, they have a, a low Frank score. Now, Frank is being able to be direct, straightforward, and to the point. Now, individuals that are low on that will probably find it hard to communicate certain issues um, that they may be facing. And so that kind of breaks down the, the communication between themselves and probably with their managers. Um, they had uh, a low wants autonomy score, and wants autonomy is the desire to have freedom and independence from authority. Now, having a low score would indicate that they probably would still like to have a lot of handholding, um, which in this environment is very different from when they were in the workspace. At the moment, they're very isolated they're by themselves. And so if you look at the third trait of Yeah, the um, I think we've gone on to a little bit of a, an internet problem there, but uh, um, clearly the um, this uh, we work closely uh, with Chum Carino and uh, a number of the practitioners on the Harrison assessment, and we've uh, uh, we've been very happy. So uh, it's amazing what the Harrison can indicate. I mean, I've had people that I thought were great employees, and they said, "Well, actually, actually, Rick, this employee will do the least amount of possible work." to actually get things done. And I was totally surprised. And they've, it's also been able to ferret out some people that you thought were great, but actually they, this person is a problem. And other people they took the test and after they said, you know what, actually I'm burned out and I'm, I'm actually done in, in the corporate real estate space. So, and that's helped us as well. So we couldn't be more uh, happy with the work that we've done uh, with Harrison. And uh, thanks to, to Chum and all his work that he's done. So we'll move on now um, to, uh, to Joju uh, Uligan. Who is, uh, uh, who is a fantastic person. I'm pleased to announce that we are uh, partnering with Harrison Profiles to, uh, to basically offer uh, remote workforce analytics to our clients. Um, and in a period of uncertainty, data, metrics are more important than ever, making sound strategic decisions with your workplace and real estate. And actually, you know, as I said to a team the other day, we're, we're becoming, you know, corporate real estate professional becoming like doctors, right? I mean, we have to fix the office solution problems, you know, mental health has become a big issue as well. I mean, with, with kids at home and stress and problems. And if you just watch, watch, watch CNN and on, on the chat groups, yeah, I mean, a lot of people can be under pressure. So there's a lot of things to consider. And obviously the health and welfare of our, our employees and staff uh, is paramount. So yeah, check, check out the Harrison stuff and, uh, and Chum will, uh, will help to sort you out. So uh, having said that, um, I'd like to provide industry's reaction and let's welcome uh, our next speaker, the president of CCAP, Jojo Uligan. Jojo is currently the president and founding board member of CCAP. He's been responsible for spearheading the association's numerous activities, including international trade missions, conferences, seminars, business matching, and networking events. Jojo is a true pioneer in the industry with more than two decades of contact center and BPO experience. Uh, before it, joining Alorica in, in 2018 as the divisional vice president, Jojo was the chief operating officer of two of PDL, PLDT companies, Kiro uh, Technica, an IT support BPO company, and EPDS, a document management solution company and data printing company. So Jojo is a wealth of information and uh, Jojo, uh, great to have you here and, and, and welcome, welcome to the group. Jojo. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, thank you to uh, Dennis, um, Satish, and Chums. Uh, it was a very interesting um, uh, presentation and sharing of, you know, how, you know, the BPO industry uh, and other industries actually reacted in, in what happened, you know, uh, in this, in this COVID-19 pandemic. And it's also interesting uh, in terms of the presentation of Chumps on the, what they did on the Harrison assessment 
in terms of assessing and checking on, you know, two important things, especially for the BPO or the contact center industry, the agents and their leaders. Uh, how this pandemic impacts our agents, our leaders, and, and how we are able to cope up and make adjustment based on, you know, uh, the current situation. So, first of all, I'd like to uh, share and, and add to what Dennis and Satish mentioned uh, in terms of the preparation for the reoccupancy or reentry, uh, when 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 you know uh, when the industry um, hit by this pandemic, but let me let me sh share with with all the other participants um, in in this uh, webinar is that you know the BPO industry in the Philippines, the contact center primarily, our agility and resiliency was again tested. Um, and uh, even 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 we got hit with this pandemic, um, uh, you know, we were in an enhanced community quarantine or or modified in unit, uh, community quarantine or GCQ. Uh, you know, to top it all, we we're, we're, we're you know uh, up to this very moment, we're still on a, on a general community quarantine, right? And we are operating based on certain limitations. So the industry never stopped um, operating. Uh, we keep the economy afloat, uh, and, and that's how the industry's resiliency and agility works. Uh, and I can identify and share, you know, based on what Dennis, Satish, and Chams mentioned, into four, four, uh, four words, if I can summarize all what we've been discussing and what really transpired and happened in the BPO and contact center industries. First, when the pandemic hit us, our first reaction is to protect. You know, um, the industry uh, protected our employees first and foremost. Uh, um, our employees very, very important to us. Our business is our people. We, without our people, we don't have any business. So we protected our people. We protected their future. We protected their jobs. We protected as well the industry to make sure that the Philippine BPO or contact center industry will continue uh, to operate, will continue to deliver the service from our clients, and will continue to, to generate uh, uh, and help the Philippine economy uh, by, by continuously operating under certain guidelines from government. So, so what we did as part of our protection is that we immediately uh, uh, prepared uh, or, or help our employees. One, uh, we have employees uh, that because of the enhanced community quarantine aren't able or, and, and because under that enhanced community quarantine uh, level, there's no public transportation. So people will have difficulty going to the office if, they, if you ask them to go to work. Uh, because there's no public transportation, right? Uh, there are only a few people who are able to do that. Those that have private transportation uh, and you know can walk. Probably people who live within within a certain you know one to two kilometer radius where they can easily walk going to their offices, right? So part of our protection is provided shuttle services. This is mentioned earlier by Dennis. We provided shuttle services for our employees to help them go to the office, right? Um, second, as what government mandated as well, we provided temporary accommodations to all our employees who can go to work uh, on site. So we, uh, Rick mentioned this, this as well, that we, we, we use our, uh, part, um, our relationship with, with the hotels, um, uh, who, or you know, condominiums, uh, and we provided accommodations for our people. Of course, uh, within certain boundaries and restrictions provided by government in terms of social distancing. Uh, part of the, the protection as well that we provided is that we enable work from home uh, in, in our industry. And uh, although work from home is not really new to us, but in the Philippines, majority of our work in the BPO or contact center space are done on site. So we immediately shifted 
again, part of our making sure that we protect our people, those that cannot go to work, we enable them uh, with, in, with uh, work from home. Um, and part of it is we, we give them the tools that they needed for them to be able to work from home. We, we, we help them with their internet connectivity. We provide them all the necessary um, equipment they needed for them to be able to work at home so that they can continue to earn, uh, so they, they can continue to be able to provide for their families. And at the same time, help the country, uh, help the economy because people are, you know, uh, are, are still working. So, you know, we want to make sure that our employees will not add up to, to the unemployment uh, because uh, brought up by this pandemic. And then the second thing that we, we did um, is we correct you know, the industries, uh, the way we do business, right? Um, so we are not used to uh, doing work from home, as I mentioned earlier, because primarily most of the work done on site. So we corrected the way we do business, wherein we manage both work at home and then at the same time, people that are on site, you know, those that we shuttle from, you know, uh, from point to point uh, to our office, those that we provide the temporary accommodations. Um, we corrected how we do our business, our processes, our tools, our technology for us to be able to uh, address, you know, how we protect our employees, our business, our country, uh, and the industry. Um, so we, we, we did all the things we can for those um, operating on site and at home. Uh, for those operating on site, Dennis mentioned and Satish, and it's, there's a similarity between the Philippines and India of what we did. So we, we do regular disinfection and cleaning of our facilities. We practice social distancing. And in fact, we adopted, the government is the same between one to two meters, but we adopted one seat apart in terms of upper, our operations. So which means that our current capacity uh, in terms of operating seats um, was cut immediately by half, 50%. Uh, why? Because of the social distancing. So imagine if you have a 300-seat center, uh, you, can only see, you can only use 150 seats of that because of social distancing. So that's one of the things that we also adopted in the industry that we also corrected based on our normal uh, way of business uh, because to make sure that we adapt to what the government is saying on social distancing at the, at the same time, you know, protect, protect our employees. Another thing that we did uh, was mentioned as well. We provided, aside from cleaning our facilities, the social distancing, the one seat apart, we provided our employees with uh, uh, alcohols or face masks, right? Uh, and, uh, and we also implemented um, health officers uh, or safety officers, as we call it, those who can make sure you know everyone is complying with the the health protocol uh, uh, mandated by government um, and the IATF, um, and 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 then part of uh, um, the corrective is uh, we we give our people certain um, uh, tools and training on how. They, they be able to, you know, uh, more effectively work from home for those who are working from home. And our leaders, we train them on how they can manage uh, a hybrid uh, type of model wherein they have agents at home and they have agents working on site. So we help them through, through training. We also adapted and changed the way we do training. We adapted virtual training. Uh, as part of our our ways of helping and making sure uh, that again our, our the safety of our employees and we didn't we didn't we didn't stop in terms of helping them and coaching them right and then the next portion of 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 what the industry did was more of the direct this is a portion of what Satish mentioned in terms of how did we help all our le leaders and agents cope up, you know, mentally and physically with, with, this, with this pandemic and with, with this kind of situation. Uh, so we, again, I, I've mentioned earlier, we adjusted our processes. Uh, 
we identify what are those metrics that we need to measure uh, and uh, what are those productivity and efficiency level that we are you know, expected from our, our agents working from home versus agents working on site. We adjusted our leader's way of managing, uh, doing coaching, uh, meetings, because we cannot meet face to face. Um, we adapted you know, uh, several technologies in terms of uh, meeting with our folks. Technologies like this, what we're using right now, Zoom, team meetings, and other forms of you know, virtual online communication. So we can establish and continue to have engagement uh, with our people and be able to help them uh, with, you know, with, their, with their work. And then, you know, part of the directing, we also made certain adjustment in terms of how do we ensure that all our people are, are uh, practicing, you know, all this government, Department of Health uh, uh, guidelines or protocols. So we have established in the industry what we call health police. So we have people roaming around uh, in different floors of our facilities, checking and making sure that you know our people follow wearing a face mask you know uh, even in their production they wear face masks uh, the only thing they the only time that they remove their face mask if they're eating or during their break and then right after that they, they they have to wear their face mask they practice social distancing so we adjusted our facility to be able to uh, cope up with that uh, or, or comply with that uh, government mandated social distancing so our pantries uh, Capacity was cut primarily to be able to comply with social distancing, uh, uh, the operations area, the meeting area, and all you know, all facilities, making sure that we comply with that, and and those are being cleaned regularly, as mentioned earlier. Uh, some uh, some companies do a regular daily cleaning. Other companies do you know every two hours cleaning of the facility. And we provided a lot of alcohol, a lot of, you know, uh, disinfectant. Uh, and, you know, uh, and that's part of, you know, us changing and complying and coping up with, with this pandemic. And then lastly, I would say after we protect, after we correct, after we direct, we continue to protect our employees uh, uh, by making sure that we continue to deploy work at home. Uh, and uh, by continuously providing shuttle services because we're back in MECQ, uh, by adjusting, again, our processes based on our learnings from several months ago. Uh, and, and Chums touch on, you know, very important aspects, which is how do we then assess, you know, our capabilities of people when we recruit people because even if you know we, we are in this pandemic, the industry continued to grow. We have clients grow, you know, clients demanding more, more people and more work. Uh, so we hire. Uh, we're continuously hiring. So we do our hiring. We adjusted our hiring as well into virtual hiring. And and you know uh, you know the hiring assessment is interesting in terms of helping identifying you know who's the right candidate, who's the right candidate will fit you know doing a work at home and will fit, you know, doing on site. So uh, this will really help us. And one of interesting, another interesting point that Chams mentioned is the ability of our agents in doing work at home. What are those experiences uh, and what are those traits uh, and, and how we, 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 the companies, the BPO companies operating will be able to help them, right? As well as our leaders, how our leaders will be adapting to this new behavior, new changes, uh, what what traits are we we need to look at with our leaders so so we can again continue to protect the industry the company the employees their jobs right as you all aware um, a lot of a lot of companies and businesses um, are are not operating and there's you know sadly there's a lot of millions of people not just in the Philippines but all over the world are affected by this pandemic and end up having you know uh, no work. So uh, that's part of our protecting our employees to make sure the company continue. Uh, we work with government, we work with our client, we work with our people, we coordinate with them. We do surveys uh, in terms of you know, people who are on site. We wanted to ask them and know 
you know, how they are feeling, how are they able to go to go to office, what are the challenges. And same thing, even our work at home agents, we are also working with them and doing survey and making sure that we can react and develop certain strategies, certain engagement activity to be able to help them. Uh, and, and I think it was you, Champs, who mentioned, you know, we uh, humans are more social, right? We, we love to... Uh, we love to talk to people and because there's no face to face and because humans are not used to a lot of virtual, you know, communications and engagement like this, uh, we needed to make certain adjustment on, on, on that as well. So right now the industry is exploring every other means on how we could be able to help more people uh, in terms of our growth. Our growth could be either work from home or on site. Uh, and how do we do it compared to, you know, before or several months ago is what we are exploring. Uh, because, for one, you know, main issues that we're having is connectivity. Uh, uh, sadly, we don't have the, you know, the, the right infrastructure, I must say, that all every people at home have good bandwidth or connectivity for them to be able to work at home. So we're working we are working with government in terms of providing certain guidance and policies on how we can improve that infrastructures. We are working with our partners, telcos, on how we can improve connectivity of our agents should we exceed or expand our work at home uh, model. We're working with companies like uh, Knight Franks uh, and with, with Rick in terms of how do we then ensure uh, our facilities can cope up and comply with all the safety protocols. How do we make adjustment uh, on our facilities? What we need to do, and we work with you know our our shareholders, our you know uh, you know the different partners, our tel our our, tele our technology providers, you know, uh, and 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 the rest of the other partners of the BPO industry, as well as our client, in making sure that we continue uh, again protecting the industry the companies, the employees, and the country. So, uh, Frank, that's all what I can say. We protect, we correct, we direct, and we protect. So thank you and good morning to everyone. Very Back to good. You, Frank. So, yeah, Jojo, Jojo Ligon, thanks so much for your words. And clearly what you're doing there is some excellent work uh, promoting the Philippines, protecting the Philippine people, protecting Philippine jobs, and keeping uh, Filipino workers to re-enter the workforce safely. So true patriot, and thanks for all you're doing there. Uh, CCAP is holding its annual industry conference, uh, Contact Islands 2020. It's a virtual conference. It's spread over eight sessions in September. This year's discussion will focus on the industry's resilience, agility, and adoption of digital customer experience under the new market realities. Please scan the QR code on your screen to register. Uh, so. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jojo. Uh, some some excellent work, and also thank you once again to our speakers, Dennis, Satish, and Chum. Uh, some incredibly insightful discussion, great insights, and no doubt you'll have some have some follow up questions and, and whatnot. But uh, thank you for your time, thank you for enthusiasm, thank you for energy in these in these challenging times, which we can we, which we foresee turn into opportunities. We'll now open the floor to questions from the audience to moderate this. May I call on Morgan McGilvery, Senior Director of Occupier Services and Commercial Agencies for Santos Knight Frank. Morgan, over to you. All right, thanks, Rick. And thank you, everyone, for joining you today. We're a little over, so we've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. So I'm going to try and summarize some of the most popular questions we're getting. The first question is going to be for Dennis and Satish, because we're getting a lot of questions about different uh, tactics for combating COVID within the office space. I will read the list of uh, some of the things we're being asked about, and then you gentlemen can choose which of these uh, different items you, can, you want to comment on. So we're getting questions about um, a Japanese health uh, authority study that says opening windows and doors can increase air circulation, which helps combating COVID. So that's really just an air circulation question. Uh, we got a question about uh, Sanavir, a misting disinfectant from Spain. And then Dennis, we also got one about whether the DOH has certified UV lamps and air purifiers as a, as a combative strategy for COVID. So gentlemen, either of you, if you want to talk about circulation within the office, if you want to talk about Senevir or other misting agents, or if you want to talk about UV lamps or air purifiers, please uh, comment on any of those you'd like to. 
Uh, Dennis or Satish, either of you can go first, Thanks, please. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, I think uh, I've read that question uh, from Stephen Rios. Uh, I think uh, there's no, uh, as uh, initially what Dennis said, uh, because of this pandemic, not uh, there is no such uh, saying that we have a complete solution. We all are working towards a solution. But whatever the practices, what this health authorities have advised in Japan, it's very much the same case in India as well. It's very important for us to see as much as possible to avoid all the duct air conditioning. Open all your windows. We do that in our offices as well. Especially the, uh, the fans, electric fans is really helping. I personally do that. See, it's all about safety today, right? I mean, if you have to be safe, uh, you know, only then you can protect. So keeping that in mind uh, to answer that question, it is very much advisable to uh, open all your windows, doors, or, uh, uh, you know, to increase the circulation. At the same time, there's no proven study with something which has come out yet. But there are lots of, uh, uh, you know, innovations which have come across, but nothing is frozen yet. So to answer your question, that is the best practices which can be followed across for a safe environment. Very good, Satish, thank you. Dennis, you want to talk about UV lamps, disinfectants, air purifiers? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Morgan, uh, thank you for uh, that, that the question that had been uh, asked. So basically, in regards to UV lamps, in terms of certification, I'm not aware that UH is uh, doing any certification of the, the radiation emitting devices. What I know is and uh, that the, the rightful body on uh, certifying this uh, over the Philippines is uh, the FDA or the Food and Drugs uh, Authority, uh, which has a section um, uh, or department that looks into the radiation health. So definitely have, you, you can look at that uh, up uh, on them, whether they're, they, they certify this, uh, this equipment. But long before uh, even the prior to COVID, uh, there had been uh, several uh, certified uh, products already available in the market. Mostly what I saw is FDA approved uh, either by U.S. I'm not really familiar about how the, the FDA of the Philippines uh, really certifies medical equipment and other devices. Uh, but I'm definite that there are certification that comes from the U.S. Uh, for uh, uh, increasing the airflow, uh, WHO has, uh, has considerable write-ups uh, with regards to increasing ventilation in the general aspect. Uh, but I agree with Satish that uh, in terms of uh, COVID-19, this is very new. So uh, we're practically reacting to everything. Uh, what, so, so basically, uh, that's the, the, the few, que few questions that we can answer. So the practices, what Dennis said on uh, UV lights, it's a very similar case in India as well, uh, but it is advisable to follow. Uh, but having said that, there is a, still a debate going on whether to use it or not. But yes, uh, uh, as per the ISRAE guidelines, uh, we can use in India. So we, as a concern, we do advise that for our clients. Yeah. All right, thanks guys. Uh, the next question is for Chum, who I believe we have back. Um, Chum, the question is, when companies are considering a work from home strategy, what are some of the things that they might fail to consider, but that they should be considering? Yeah, thanks for the question, Morgan. I think, um, you know, looking back several months, um, you know, the world is really thrusted into this new uh, environment and people really didn't know what to do. But I think typically management um, will first look to, you know, trying to ensure that business continuity um, follows through to make sure that the organiz organization runs smoothly. You know, they first look at things like internet connectivity. Do they have access to um, work-related devices and files? Um, but now that we've had actually had a few months into this, um, it's important to also look at the other factors, the personal factor, the social environment. Um, do these individuals have the right behavioral um, competencies um, that will make them successful in the remote work environment? You know, we find that, um, you know, if an individual um, has about 75% of the things that they do like in their job and in their environment, they're three times more likely to succeed. And I think that the Dalai Lama um, once said that after all, um, we humans are social beings. And so it's important to look at that social factor as well as uh, the other factors related to the technical aspects of the work. 
Very good, Chum. And maybe a quick follow-up question, Chum. Um, Satish mentioned a couple times in his presentation uh, that one of the hurdles of reoccupancy is the employees having fear about going back into the office. Yeah. Would Harrison be able to help companies kind of diagnose which employees are more prone to experience fear in reoccupancy? Yeah, certainly. There's, a, there's a 175 factors that we look at. And from that, we look at what um, drives a person, what motivates them. But at the same time, also, you can start to have that conversation with the individual about what are these fears that they're facing. It's uh, you know, an objective way to open up this discussion with them um, so that uh, at least the thing is, once the individual looks at the results, um, they can become self-aware of these things that they may not know. Um, so that at least starts the process um, to get them more confident to get back to the workplace. Um, and so I think having this assessment is a first step um, to self-awareness, but at the same time, what can we do and what are these steps that we can do to get people back in um, as a result of these fears and uh, challenges that they may be facing? All right, very good, thanks. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about the outlook for the leasing market here in Manila. Uh, Rick, I know you're not really part of this panel, but I thought if you've got any, any thoughts about the um, near and long-term health of the leasing market here, and maybe I'll complement your answers when you're done. Yeah, I, I think the um, as you said earlier. I mean, I I, th I think this is a, this is a great opportunity. I think it's it's a great shifting of the market again. I think the market clearly is shifted from a landlord's market to a tenant's market. We kind of hit we kind of hit a car crash here around the world, and uh, when COVID hit the world in in February March. So we see huge opportunities for tenants now to restructure, expand, and also the call centers, BPOs, to also pick up some great people. So we see this as a, a co complete reset, uh, a complete opportunity for corporates, and even also some landlords um, to, to look at things. But we need to get, take a corporate real estate approach, and every tenant, every landlord is gonna need really, really good, solid corporate real estate advice. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, thank you. And I'll just, uh, as the head of leasing here, uh, make a few comments about what I'm seeing as well. Uh, first is that we're seeing an uptick in subleasing activity in this market. So some firms, the least expensive way for them to uh, give up some office space that they, they can no longer pay for, unfortunately, is to put that space up for sublease. And so those looking to acquire space can become sub lessees, and that often works quite well. Second thing we're seeing is that uh, social distancing is probably not a long-term strategy. So we're not seeing companies that are going to lease 150% of the space they need over the long term. Uh, so more likely they'll go back to about 100% of the space they need uh, for their future leases. Uh, third, we are seeing some companies that um, are going to do smaller but better. So perhaps if they've got 1,000 square meters now, they might drop that down to 700, but they're going to invest in better buildings, better fit outs to generally improve the office environment. So they're just going to repurpose their uh, occupancy money towards better spaces for their employees. And then finally, over the long term, we'll probably see a little bit of a smaller supply pipeline in the coming years. So we def definitely think that the ongoing construction in Metro Manila and some of the provinces should be sufficient for demand for the coming two to three more years. So we probably will see a little bit of a smaller building pipeline throughout the Philippines uh, for a while. So those are four kind of observations, I think, that we can expect probably in the uh, short to medium term in this market. And thank you all for asking. And uh, I think that's it for the questions. So we're going to be turning it over. Uh, Rick, I'll give it back to you uh, to announce our uh, speaker for the closing remarks. Very good, well moderated panel, uh, Morgan. And thank you again to Dennis, Satish, Chum, and Jojo. Excellent work, excellent discussion, and cl clearly just the start of many great things we can work on together. Uh, big thanks to Paolo and Angel and team once again for doing a fantastic job with these webinars. A lot of work goes in behind the scenes. So, and then a, a big thank you to once again to our partner, American Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the panelists for sharing your insights this morning. Thank you also to the support of CCAP. Uh, please make sure you also join our upcoming webinars. Uh, next Tuesday, the August 11th, we have a deep dive session on best practices in property management in Southeast Asia with Knight Frank Malaysia, the Urban Land Institute of the Philippines, and FIRMA. This is perfect learning for owners and landlords. You can scan the Q QR code to quickly register. On August 25th and 27th, we'll, we'll conduct advanced green building masterclass session about our healthy buildings in partnership with AmCham Philippines. Check the QR code for details. If you have any questions about the discussion, you can email the address on the screen and a member of my team will get back to you soonest. Everyone, please stay, sa please stay safe, healthy, 
uh, we'll get this thing will end. We will get through it together. Let's look for the opportunity and uh, uh, have a great day and great week and see you again our next web webinar. Thanks very much. Maraming salamat and buenas. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone.